Welcome to Mana's Seal YouTube channel. The previous video link is on the description box or on the top right card. Volume 12 The Paladin of the Holy Kingdom. The undead were beings who hated the living. As someone who could utterly dominate them and keep them from harming living creatures, the Sorcerer King must be a truly incredible person. Nia was deeply impressed by the might of the Sorcerer King. I see. Ah. Then, can you take us inside the room? Please follow me. The black undead creature slowly stepped away from the door, and the soldier boldly walked past him. In contrast, Nia and the others seemed to be looking at each other to see who would make the first move. While he said that this undead creature was ruled by the Sorcerer King, those bonds were not visible to the naked eye. This made walking in front of it several times more frightening to them than going before, say, a carnivore who was unchained, but which would not attack because his belly was full. Remedios planned to go forward first, but Gustavo stopped her. After that, he looked to Nia. I'm the canary, huh? There was nothing wrong with that logic when one considered whose life would matter least if it was lost. Even so, despite their determination to protect the weak, their own squire was a different matter. Nia steeled herself for what lay ahead, squeezed her eyes shut, and then strode forward. After taking several steps forward, she slowly opened her eyes. She had not been cut down. She quickened her pace, and hastily moved past the undead being. After seeing Nia had crossed safely, the other paladins followed behind her. In the end, nobody was attacked, and they reached their destination. The soldier opened the door, revealing a long table and many plain chairs. Please wait in this room for a while. Understood. Thank you for leading us here. Remedios jerked her chin, and Gustavo produced a small pouch from safekeeping, and handed it to the soldier who had brought them here. It was a tip. Please don't. His rejection was so fierce that it was almost like a cry of despair. The soldier raised his hands above his head, utterly unwilling to touch that pouch. Everyone was shocked by his reaction, as was Nia. She could not think of any reason for the soldier's reaction. We are all paid by his majesty, so please allow me to refuse your show of consideration. But, but since you did us a service, and it's not a very big sum, no. No, there's no need for that. I'll wait outside until the seminar is over. The soldier swiftly retreated from the room. The remaining people looked at each other, mystified by the soldier's overwrought reaction. Is that really all right? He said no, so there's nothing we can do about it. Tipping was a natural thing. Well not tipping was not a problem, most people of stature did practice tipping. Of course, some people did so to minimize the time needed for luggage inspections, and ask people to take care of various small matters, but they had not made any such requests. Frankly speaking, they were simply doing what would be expected of people in their station. If that was an instruction from the Sorcerer King, then what was his aim in doing so? We weren't told where to sit. So it's free seating, then. After everyone sat as the captain had directed, a short time passed before the door opened once more. Nia turned back, and then her eyes went wide. The entity who had entered was not human. It was a creature whose species had a human's upper body and a snake's lower body, a naga. There were several offshoots of the naga race, for instance, the sea nagas which occasionally appeared along the Holy Kingdom's coasts, but which subspecies this one belonged to was unclear. However, all of them were demihumans who held no goodwill for humanity, yet Nia did not feel terribly afraid. All this was thanks to that black undead. Compared to that, she could at least muster up a rational response to this. Ah. Uh, was that what it was all about? That frightening undead creature was not just intended to frighten people, but to numb people to the shock of seeing demihumans. They really did put a lot of thought into letting demihumans coexist with humans. It would seem the Sorcerer King was not just a powerful undead being. The Naga slithered through the silent room, paying no heed to the group's response as he moved in front of them, whereupon he bowed slightly. Thank you for waiting, dear humans who wish to enter this city. This one is an immigration official for the Sorcerer's Kingdom, Rirarius Spinia I Indurin. Well, it is hardly a vocation which will bring this one into contact with you, so there is no need to remember that name. Then, without further ado, let us begin. This one will briefly explain the differences between living in this city and the surrounding cities, as well as things one should be aware of. Firstly, drawing weapons within the city is strictly forbidden. That was a very reasonable admonition, and Nia let the tension flow out of her shoulders. Hm, many would think of it as an ordinary reminder, Rirarius pointed to his face with a slender finger. It's written all over your faces. However, I would like you to remember that many races walk the streets of the Sorcerer's Kingdom. You have already seen the undead holding their heads up high and walking proudly through the streets. Even if they strike you as dangerous beings, drawing your weapon on them without provocation would be a serious crime, no. A moment please. Does that mean we must flee if a dangerous being appears? That is not the case. Even if there are dangerous entities in the city, none of them will harm you. 
Even so, there are cases where people feel afraid, or they feel they might be attacked, and thus they draw their weapons anyway. That is what this one was talking about. Can you be sure we won't be attacked? Oh yes, of the many dangerous creatures who walk through this place, those who will most alarm you are probably his majesty's subordinates. Bairaria smiled tiredly. Once you stay here for more than a day, your wariness will wane, and you will no longer mind them. Well, the first day is the biggest problem. And of course, drawing your weapons in self-defense is perfectly fine. I see. So it's alright as long as it's done in self-defense. Hmm, yes. Also, mind control magic will be used in the course of investigating crimes in this city. Please keep that in mind. Nia's eyes went wide. Nor was she the only one to do so. The commotion erupted from the paladins. As their representative, Remedios stated her opinion. A moment please. Is the sorcerer's kingdom such a crude nation? Do they allow the use of spells? Are the courts also that way? In general, mind control magic was not used when questioning people about crimes. For instance, by using dominate, one could make anyone a criminal for a brief period of time. By using charm, one could find a patsy for any crime. The fact that mind control magic could be used to manufacture offenders to one's liking, caused it to be viewed as a crude act practiced only by tyrants. The courts also use similar means. Oh, but I can confidently say that his majesty will not compel you to speak on truths. On that point you need not worry. How could anyone believe that? The use of mind control magic meant that once a nation decided that someone was a dangerous individual, they could paint them as a criminal, and then deal with them. No human being would trust an undead being they had never met before. Nobody said that, but they probably all felt the same way. Also, I wish to ask, if you will not enter, will you be returning right away? No, we can't do that. Please allow us entry. Ho. Oh, that was the quickest answer yet. Traders would usually ask for time and then discuss among themselves. Then, let us continue. After that, Ryarius touched on how undead horses drew carriages along the roads, and other weird things that seemed to mess with her mind. However, when he said, sometimes dragons will fly overhead, so do not be alarmed or let your horses run amok, her face twitched. Having dragons fly above a city was not something that could be summarized as a big incident. Dragons were creatures against whom even fully armed and prepared heroes might fall in combat. That was why all warriors dreamed of slaying a dragon. Slaying an overwhelmingly superior creature with the strength they had honed, their comrades, and their weapons was a glorious deed and a deed that only the most superlative of warriors could perform. Surely it would cause a great disturbance if such a dragon were to appear in a dwelling place for humans. The undead are fine, because we've already seen them as guards, but dragons, no, still, having one fly overhead as a sentry ought to be fine, right? Also, they have many age categories, and their strength varies greatly depending on their age. Freshly hatched dragons were still dragons. However, such a tiny dragon was more easily controlled than the undead creature from just now. Then, that is about it. Thank you for listening. Now, can you follow the soldier back to the gate after you leave this room? Forgive me, but may I ask a question? Remedios raised a hand. Hmm. And what might that be? You don't intend to kill or eat us, do you? Perhaps this one might have thought of doing so in the past. However, that is strictly forbidden now. In addition, after seeing His Majesty, I feel that there is no point in feuding with my fellow inferior lifeforms. Is His Majesty really that powerful? Ryarius smiled tiredly. He is ten times more powerful than you can imagine. Him aside, even his subordinates are extraordinarily potent. Simply put, there is no safer city than one which His Majesty defends. Perhaps she was thinking of something, but Remedios fell silent. This one does not know why you have come here. However, let me give you some sage advice, that an old friend, a certain late contemporary of mine, learned with his own body. Declaring your opposition to his majesty would be extremely foolish. A wise man would immediately throw himself at his feet and beg for mercy. There was a shocking sense of reality to those words. While he said he had heard it from a friend, it was more like that the Naga called Ryrarius was speaking from personal experience. Thank you for your advice. Remedios stood, followed closely by everyone else. Nia bowed to Ryarius from where she stood at the rear of the group before leaving the room. They walked along the streets of Erantel. The group's destination was the inn which the gate guards had told them was the highest class establishment in this city, the Shining Gold Pavilion. Nia looked at the assorted people along the streets. Ryarius's words had given her the impression that this nation was filled with demihumans and the undead. However, the reality was different, most of the pedestrians were human. The only undead she saw were groups of the same undead being they had seen near the city gates, as well as horse-shaped undead with bodies of bones and fog who pulled carriages. There were no other kinds besides them. On the other hand, there were all kinds of demihumans. A group of goblins marched down the streets in neat formation, each of them radiating the aura of a seasoned veteran. That immediately shattered the impression Nia had of goblins. 
No, it was not just Leah who was that way. Gasps of surprise came from the paladin contingent. There were also a Demihuman with a rabbit's face wearing a maid's uniform, as well as a bipedal frog-like Demihuman, but she had only seen one example of each in the city. It seems more normal than I imagined, well, not that normal, but still, it's quite similar to a human nation. You can hardly tell that it's under the thumb of a terrifying undead king. There were no looks of fear on the faces of the citizens walking along the streets. Nia was not sure if this was because they had resigned themselves, they had grown used to it, or they had decided that there was no need to worry about living with the undead. However, there were no signs of chaos on the streets. At times, she even heard the sound of children laughing. This is much better compared to Jaldabiath, I guess. Just then, Remedios suddenly halted her horse. Since their leader, who was traveling at the group's head, had stopped, the rest of them had no choice but to follow suit. Excuse me, Dwarf San. May I ask you a few questions? Remedios was addressing three dwarves who were working by the side of the road. There were also three skeletons performing earthworks under the dwarves' orders. The culture shock she had received after entering the city had been so great that she now thought little of seeing skeletons. There was even a hint of relief in her mind which came from seeing an opponent which even she could win against. What? Who are you guys? Which country do you hail from? I apologize for speaking from horseback. However, we are from the Holy Kingdom, and we are looking for the unknown as the Shining Gold Pavilion. May we ask how to get there? Shining. Shining Gold Pavilion. Ah, that's a classy place. The dwarves gave them rough directions. However, it differed slightly from what the gate guards had told them, and it felt like they were being sent slightly off course. However, her real objective was not asking directions, 